So the first uh, item on the agenda, uh, oh, and um, there's a, a place uh, to write your name as attendees on the, the um, agenda pad. So if you're here, please feel free to add your name there so we know you attended. Um, so the first item here is to review action items from the orchestration survey. So to recap, uh, in the past month, we discussed uh, survey findings that we had from uh, the, the latest survey we sent out that talk, uh, asked a lot of questions about orchestration and also performance. And when we were going over those results, we had a lot of low hanging fruit uh, pieces from the orchestration part, especially. And we wanted to share some action items that have been created from directly from that survey. Um, so if you click on that link there, uh, uh, let's see. Oh, okay. You know what, Neha, I think um, Adam Creightman did some refactoring to the tag field. So let me find those issues really quick. We had them filter out by the, filtered out by the tags, but one second. I have them on hand still. So the first one is this issue. Uh, it's a feature for in Ceph ADM to add an option to apply an OSD service spec that will create OSDs in a one-off fashion, then set itself unmanaged. So this was to address uh, the issue that was brought up in the orchestration surveys about um, automatic OSD creation and that there was too much um, automation going on. And uh, Adam King, the orchestration lead, has pinned that down to um, uh, service spec files uh, that still reference older um, services that may not be around anymore. Um, so he's come up with this. Go ahead. Somebody just needed to mute themselves. I think you're good. Oh, sounds good. Um, yeah, essentially, this uh, this is a, a feature open in direct response to that to address uh, the over automation of OSD creation with Ceph ADM. And then the second issue was this one, uh, and it's uh, cre uh, created directly in response to the documentation feedback we got ar around Ceph ADM. Uh, and this uh, will reorder some of the documentation that describes the specs, which can be confusing, um, and it'll be better organized. So um, users uh, have uh, uh, more examples to look from and examples of uh, how to deploy, things like that. So um, that was created directly off of the feedback we got from the user survey. And I just see Adam King on the call. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add to that or anything, but um, I pretty much summarized what's on your the trackers you shared. But. No, that was, that was an okay um, summary, I think. Cool. And at the time, there's no specific ETA on any of these items, but we just wanted to show that these are in our roadmap and um, these are things to look out for that this is the kind of work that we really want to emphasize doing from the user dev meetings, you know, coming users coming with feedback. And then um, we really do want to use this feedback to um, work that into what we're doing and uh, create act, uh, action items based on, on things that we can directly address. Um, so the next topic is uh, similar. Uh, we also got a lot of feedback on the last survey about per, uh, performance, specifically around mclock, and the type of feedback we got was um, not quite as straightforward as Orchestrator. Um, a lot of people had uh, mixed feelings about mclock and how it's performing with uh, with backfill and um, other operations like that. So 
we, what we were able to glean from that survey is, okay, MCLOC needs to be a focus, although we don't have a specific, um, you know, action item that was created from the survey. We did want to share uh, some work that has been, um, some investigative work that has been going on for MCLOC uh, that was found internally. And we encourage, so so we'll, we'll describe this issue, um, but then we'd also encourage uh, any user on this call, if something that you're experiencing sounds similar to what's described in this tracker, um, feel free to comment on the tracker or um, this might inspire you to create your own tracker uh, about a, another issue you're experiencing. Um, but this is the type of work that we're, uh, we're investigating into MCLOC at the moment. So thanks. I think Neha had just shared the tracker there. Let me open that. Yep. So I think the, thanks for the context, Laura. Uh, the idea is that we're putting some work in this direction. Uh, where we have a more pinpointed issue related to performance of MCLOCK. And uh, we have a couple of folks here who have been heavily involved in this. Uh, we've got Sridhar and I also see Vikyat, you're here. If you guys want to just briefly uh, talk about in what scenario this is happening and uh, what kind of investigation we are planning around it, that'd be nice. Sure. Um, I'll give you Vikya, do you want to um, explain the issue or can I go ahead? In the testing framework, uh, what we do. Uh, and then I think uh, so that you can explain. So uh, we found this in the performance testing. Uh, so uh, performance testing has two stages. And it was very much objects uh, RGW workload. Uh, a small file and large file, both. Like small object would be 1 KB to 256 KB. Large object would be 1 MB to 256 MB and around 300 buckets. Uh, and uh, what we do in general testing, like we don't, uh, like there's no failure in the system. We do a pure write workload and then we do hybrid workload, which has read, write, delete, and list or stat. Um, we, we did see that uh, when we do pure write workload, it was back to back consistent. It's a Two and a half hour workload for a small object and then we do when pure hybrid workload without any failure it was two hour workload everything was good back-to-back -back runs were completely fine if you see the tracker the numbers were pretty much consistent uh, then we have stages of uh, phase one phase like phase one where we have, don't have failure phase two when we bring down one complete osd node so in that node we have 24 osds and this is a hybrid osd node which means that the DBs are in NVMe and data is in spindles. And the phase three is when we bring out another OSD node. Uh, and phase four is when we bring back both the OSD nodes. And then we give around 24 hour window to you know, backfill how many number of PGs are being backfilled during that time. So what we saw uh, in this testing that when we were running back to back runs like for repeatability in performance word, we, you have to have repeatability to make sure that these numbers are consistent. So I think we ran around four to five rounds of back-to-back uh, -back runs, and we saw that every other run was not consistent, especially in phase two, when we were bringing the first node down. Uh, like sometime it was giving the performance number in like 120 Mbps, sometime it was giving like 180 Mbps. And uh, we saw that uh, it is not deterministic. So that's when we opened the tracker. Um, we switched the profile back to WPQ, to wanted to look into like how WPQ is doing in this. And what we saw that WPQ was consistent. Uh, uh, so it felt like it's only M clock where we are seeing this issue. Uh, some tuning and investigation was given to us like some test conditions like test case one, test case two and test case three. We saw that when we applied the test case one, uh, the performance was almost back to uh, how almost near to WPQ and it, it was also not that consistent, but uh, it was in the 5% ballpark uh, when when uh, we used that tuning. What we saw in the investigation uh, when we were testing that, MCLOCK was doing a lot of, allocating a lot of recovery bandwidth with the balanced default profile. So for example, when we were getting 180 or 120 MBS PS in the phase two, when we were bringing node one down, uh, 
the WPQ was running only like 80 MB, 80 or 60 MB as a recovery ops, but in M clock it was like 160 ops, so uh, 160 Mbps. That's the toll it was taking. So this is how the general, uh, I mean, like our test framework is, and then the investigation which we have done so far. Sridhar, over to you. Yeah. So as we have described, uh, the the things that we applied, uh, they they did seem to help uh, improve the client throughput. Uh, but um, the analysis of the uh, recovery throughput showed that um, although although we set the uh, client uh, the recovery limit down to around 80% of the overseas bandwidth. Um, the measured throughput for recoveries that we uh, that we uh, that we saw didn't align with uh, what we expected. So it's uh, lower than what we expected. So the, the idea is uh, during the degraded recoveries, we want the the uh, recoveries to happen uh, as quickly as possible. Of course, there will be some impact to the client throughput, uh, but it shouldn't be as significant as what is described in this uh, tracker. It should be within a specific threshold. Um, but at the same time, we need the degraded recoveries to happen quickly uh, because we need um, we need the object to be um, uh, to have enough copies uh, to avoid the data safety issue. So currently, the the investigation that that so currently, we go as a sub. I think that, that that going on is to uh, identify why uh, the degraded recoveries are not aligning with the the limit setting. Uh, so uh, that's something that uh, we are uh, trying to um, investigate uh, uh, quite uh, thoroughly. Um, and this may involve uh, uh, additional uh, changes to uh, the unlock uh, uh, scheduler uh, and possibly the uh, the algorithm as well. So that's something that uh, currently uh, the investigation is currently on the process. So as um, Laura mentioned, um, uh, we, we just don't want, want to know from the community as to uh, if, if any, anyone has faced this kind of an issue, uh, either this issue or any other issue that you may be facing. Uh, please do uh, give us give us a feedback and uh, open tracker as necessary. And uh, we'll try to address that. Yeah, that's all I had. Thanks. Thanks, both of you. Yeah, any questions? If anyone have questions, you can answer. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I think we're good. Yeah, doesn't look like it, but yeah, just worth mentioning that this work is um, part of some of the reef and squid uh, performance testing that this team has been doing. And uh, this is uh, the latest finding from that. So um, as far as we know, this is not a particular issue related to a particular release. So if the fix uh, becomes available, it will be backported. All right, I think that's that's pretty much it on this topic, unless somebody else have anything to add. If not, let's move on. All right, uh, the next topic is a recap from Safde India um, with user feedback. And I believe that's Skorov's topic. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm here from the Safe Ambassadors team. We have really had a nice safe day in India. I'll uh, just share my screen and uh, slides, prepared a bunch of slides to share the feedback with everyone here. Please let me know once you are able to see the screen. It's visible, right? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. showing the Jitsi point of view, though. You you almost went to the slides. Yeah, I think that that's, that's it. Yeah, the slides are visible, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So we had a great event in uh, uh, in India. It was a nice day event. We had around 150 
uh, attendees, um, we got a lot of feedback around various use cases. Uh, the various use cases that we understood that people were using it for was block, object, CSI, even some mentioned about AI, ML, uh, having large scale workloads, NFS. In block particularly, uh, users were also looking forward to the NVMe OF feature and support and that, 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 that we have uh, in the community in the upcoming. Uh, uh, also, they were looking for the, uh, um, I mean, they are using uh, Ceph as a, a lot of the users are using it as a backend for OpenStack. A lot of them are using, I think a small uh, amount of users were also mentioning that they were using it for uh, uh, as a distributed file storage, uh, as FFS, uh, with a large number of small file and directory based workload. Mm, the versions that we uh, we saw that uh, I, I've ordered based on the most used one was Quincy, then followed by Reef, then Pacific, and Octopus was the least used one. Uh, and we also asked what are the different tools that you are using to manage Ceph. Uh, topmost answer was Ansible uh, or CLI. Um, some of them were using a dash, Ceph dashboard here. Uh, we definitely got a lot of feedback around the dashboard. Uh, asked people to ask, ask the audience how many people are using the dashboard. The percentage was very less uh, in a single digit. Uh, we had a panel from uh, panel uh, uh, it was a, we had a panel uh, led by uh, Venki, uh, Nizam, Ashwarya, and Kotresh. It was a nice panel as well. Uh, so we asked the question, what what can make Ceph user experience better? So they mentioned, um, I mean, having more granular metrics in the dashboard, having a centralized management console, uh, console better documentation. They still uh, they didn't point didn't point out to any anything specific, uh, but uh, definitely mentioned uh, better documentation, better advertisement uh, in social media visibility, uh, dynamic functionalities to make Ceph's integration with the application more better. Uh, a lot of the feedback was around the user experience side of things, how the, the community and the users look forward to the improvements in the user experience and the usability side of things. Some of the feedback was also around the content performance and it, it I mean, it's all, they all, it always, uh, they, it, the community would love it if we have a regular feedback inter, interaction uh, um, and system dis, uh, di, and discussion with the community. So I think um, more and more, I think, I think Seth, I, we also advertised, uh, we, I don't know, we also, uh, share about the Ceph user council initiative uh, with the community and uh, uh, shared with them how the user council initiative could be better uh, about reaching out to us, the community and join the forum as well. Uh, here, participate in the discussions around here. So uh, yeah, people are looking forward to that. Um, Thing, things we asked, what would you like to see in the UI? One one particular thing they mentioned was centralized multi-cluster management dashboard, how they can embed their apps easily with the dash, with the Ceph storage, um, multi-tenancy, better alerts and monitoring. Inter the last one is pretty interesting. They mentioned generative AI integration for suggestions based on different hardware types and workloads. So that's... Uh, most of the feedback that we got from the Safe Days India event and the community. Any thoughts, any questions, or just any comments from anyone? Um, yeah, thanks for sharing those slides, Gaurav. Those are really great. I'd be curious to know um, the specifics around, like you said, there was a lot of dashboard feedback. Um, 
I'd be interested to know what people said specifically about those types of things. So we can, we could perhaps do something like we did with the orchestrator feedback and um, use it to create some action items. I think a, a great part would be, I think, what uh, would be to understand what user, I think we can maybe roll out a user survey where we can ask people what do they expect in the dashboard then what do they want to see better and uh, around the lines of dashboard and usability uh, how would they uh, like the user experience to be better as well because to be honest uh, there were hardly uh, even a single digit number out, out, uh, out of the big audience who were actually using the dashboard so do you have any idea of what what was the scale of their clusters? Was that a question that you asked? Uh, particularly, uh, no, I don't uh, have, an, have much idea about the scale of their clusters. I think some of the users might be here as well. I think we can maybe uh, roll, roll out a question open in the community. Uh, how many people are uh, using that dashboard at various scales? I think it will be great to understand as well, I think. We Just have a hand up. Uh, like uh, one of the feedback from our side for dashboard has been, uh, so uh, hello everyone, I'm Utkarsh. I am from the Ceph engineering team in Canonical. Uh, we do Ceph on Ubuntu. And one of the biggest reasons our customers do not really use the Ceph dashboard is because uh, it has a very stringent dependency on the orchestrator uh, framework. To like for us, most of the like most of the stuff doesn't really work. We cannot really spawn new services because we don't use the orchestrator framework. Uh, it's implemented differently using Juju. So. And I mean, it's not like we have not tried to look into the orchestrator framework thingy, but it does feel like uh, a different uh, approach. So uh, I, I, like this is just our feedback, but uh, we have been staying away from actively using set dashboards mostly for uh, the incoherence with our uh, deployments. So you mentioned dependency on orchestration. Essentially, what you're trying to say is that the chef dashboard under the hood is using orchestrator. That is what you're trying to say? Yes, yes. I mean, what I'm trying to say is we don't use orchestrators. So how Juju uh, deploys Ceph or how Microsoft deploys Ceph uh, is independent of the orchestrator uh, framework completely. So we we miss out on the uh, all the goodness that the dashboard can make out of using that. OK, so you're not using the dashboard. You're not using Ceph ADM either. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. So we don't use Ceph ADM at, at all. Ceph ADM is for containerized Ceph, right? Uh, right. Yeah. We, yeah we, don't, we don't actively do containerized Ceph at all. OK. Yeah. So most of our Ceph dashboard uh, work is around integrating with uh, alerting and monitoring and stuff. And uh, like the graphs and the alerts are directly viewed in the application rather than viewing them in the SEP dashboard. We use Prometheus and Grafana dashboards directly uh, uh, to consume uh, those dashes. Got it. OK. Yeah, I think um, in we can have a survey in that way where people, when people mention that they are not using the dashboard, it's good to understand why, what's the reason, right? And um, is is it because of the scale as well at the at which they're using, or they just prefer to go to CLI? Because uh, I think around the feedback that I asked was pe people mentioned that they prefer to see they, they prefer CLI uh, much more. Uh, to look into things rather than the dashboard. So I think one of the areas that can be improved is I think 
I think it will be great, great to great if users can have a philosophy of going to dashboard first and uh, see if something is there in the CLI but not in the dashboard. Raise trackers in with the project and because that will uh, lead lead us um, and lead lead to more improvements. Right? What are the issues that users are facing or what are the things that they are not seeing currently, which they would want to, even from a troubleshooting standpoint or even from a user standpoint. I think around all all those lines, I think I would I would definitely do that more from my side as well. Uh. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm Jayant. I actually attended uh, Safety India. And uh, I believe, uh, just like Gaurav mentioned, uh, out of the single digit uh, members who, who, I mean, the SF users who use dashboard, we are uh, one of them, right? I mean, our scale, uh, the, the cluster scales, we, we mainly use Cepheidium uh, uh, for, for all of our clusters. I mean, these are Cepheidium orchestrated clusters. And we primarily use dashboard. So, so that is the one. So our scale is around 22, 25 petabytes of SF, totally orchestrated. Uh, using Cepheidium and we prim uh, we primarily use dashboard for everything yeah from service orchestration to pretty much yeah so so th some things i would uh, like to say here is i mean so only one uh, since this dashboard is pretty much uh, being improved at, at at a very good scale and Ceph v3 has started uh, putting more and more things into the dashboard like multi-site configuration for rgw cffs uh, file system management and and other things. So one of the things which I highlighted in Safetys India is to have some kind of uh, probes. Even I mean I mean just like uh, for example, let's say we have RGW uh, demons uh, which are responding uh, right. I mean to, to HTTP requests. So the thing is we have been experiencing. I I think this is mostly mostly related to Safetyum, uh, part not related to the dashboard or something. Um, so in some cases RGW demons. Would, would be in running state, but they fail to respond. So we get uh, L4 timeouts and L7 timeouts. So that's where maybe uh, some improvements are needed in that way. And similarly for NFS demons as well. So these are uh, CFFS uh, exports, I mean CFFS um, or NFS. So some kind of uh, health probes or uh, something like that. Like, and that would be of uh, great help. Yep, that's good feedback. I think let's put it down in our notes, and then you know we can follow up about it at a uh, you know CDM with the right teams. I don't see anybody from the uh, dashboard here. Is, is there anybody? No, but I guess Adam is here from orchestration, but needs both parties uh, for the discussion. Also, it would be. Um very helpful, especially since uh, or for us to pass on uh, to the dashboard team, if you could create like a uh, an RFE or a, a feature re uh, request tracker, um, kind of detailing what you just said and with the specific examples, that would be really helpful for us to pass along to the dashboard team. Yep, and thank you so much for your feedback, Jayant. Cool. Yeah, and it sounds like we might be in the works for a dashboard survey to get more concerted feedback. That'll be a discussion that we'll have to figure um, out the best way to go about that, but it's good to know. Any more comments on this topic? I guess I have a side comment. Um, uh, it's very nice to see the actual folks who are at Sev Day India coming and providing feedback in this forum too. So that's the whole purpose of this meeting as well. So that was refreshing. Yes, thank you. Right, yeah, I mean, Gaurav was, uh... I mean, very specific about uh, the user and dev meeting and the user community as well. So I, I liked, uh, I mean, certain bits of it. So, yep. 
Yeah, that's great feedback. Great. And we have, I wanted to just add a plug for Safe Days London as well. We have another community event coming in, uh, being organized in London as well. Folks who are around, uh, please do uh, join the community for the event over there as well. Uh, and Danny uh, and uh, Danny, our ambassador uh, from UK, uh, he's uh, also leading the uh, effort and initiative. So, yeah, please check the event out. I've shared the link in the chat. Thank you. All right, I think uh, we'll move on to the last topic here. Um, this is from Stefan, Seth, a stretch mode, love and care. Go for it. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so I put this up on the list. Um, so I've, uh, yeah, I, I had some uh, stretch mode, uh, self stretch mode. Um, uh, issues that I uh, run into uh, when setting up a stretch mode for a customer. And um, there were actually quite a few of them. So I thought, uh, let's let's put them on the list and bundle them and uh, see if we can, well, at least have the devs have a look at them and see if we can fix this. Um, let me put up a poll here. Um, um not sure how many people actually use stretch mode that are in this call i personally think there are not that many people using stretch mode i don't know if we ever asked this question in a survey um just thinking out loud um but if you do please let me know um so yeah there are a couple of issues well first let me say it's a great it's a great way of running Ceph. i mean Gregory put a lot of effort in making it like a really stable. Um, so last week I did a migration and converted like a improper um, self cluster into a proper stretch mode cluster. And um, yeah, it worked great. Uh, but still there are a couple of things that uh, would make it even better. So yeah, the, the first tracker I put up um, is that that you also would have the possibility to disable it. So as it currently stands, it's a one-way traffic. You can enable it, but you cannot disable it. And well, some operators out there might want to transform some point in time, maybe from a dual data center setup to a regular free, uh, yeah, free data center setup. So uh, currently that's not possible um yeah so that it, it it would be nice to also have an exit strategy um if a user would uh accidentally enable stretch mode uh you know, you, you're kind of stuck with it um so yeah it would be really nice if we could have that addressed um oh and then junior, uh, hi 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 Stefan. so um, my name is junior i actually um work on um stretch mode um uh, Greg kind of like did um, laid the groundwork on um, or was the original author. I kind of like picked up the work. Um, so I, my question is that um, when you say three sites, do you mean like three sites, um, like three data replic like stretch across three sites, or two sites with like OSDs and one site with like the tiebreaker? Uh, you mean in in um, which specific example? You mean like if you want to convert it from one state to the other no it would be a stretch when you were talking about like three sites i because right now we only support like two sites um we have the third sites to be like only like a tiebreaker monitor it doesn't have any like obvious in it um yeah, sure. so it's stretched across only two sites um, yeah that's to... that's that's fine with me okay. it's it's not that i want to have support for yet another data center within stretch mode it's like if you want to exit the stretch mode and go to a um replicated setup with uh, stretch over three different data centers. Yep. So um, stretch, you, it's like also stretch, but it not like as in stretch mode. Right. I understand. You want to um, basically disable it, have a safe way to 
you know, bring back um, from stretch mode. I, I think um, we used to have this discussion like two years ago. Um, I think I, I agree that we should have this feature. Um, the, I don't think the hard part is implementing it. Um, I think the hard part is probably um, testing it correctly, making sure that like the data movements um, are, you know, correct and um, the monitor quorum are not like affected, basically safely moving back um, to like the normal setup. Um, but yeah, um, I understand like um, why your motivation. Okay, yeah, I, I, I would definitely uh, want to help testing this. Like, uh, no problem. I've done a lot of testing already and yeah, sure. Uh, we can help out there. Um, so well, good to hear that you know, it's, it's not as easy as just like, just make a disable button and we're done with it. There's a lot of things to involve. Uh, there's a lot of things involved uh, in, in doing that properly. So I agree with you. Um, so yeah, next up is a tracker regarding the um, maximal, maximum available storage uh, that is displayed. It's already fixed, uh, but uh, the fix has uh, not been upstreamed yet and has been, I, um, Well, there is a run testing sorry. 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 Oh yeah, right. go ahead. Uh, yes, we have, uh, we have a patch uh, for this, uh, uh, for this bug. Uh, we have it uh, for a long time, and it's still not merged yet. Uh, let me throw more light uh, on uh, what's going on with this particular uh, problem, with this particular issue. Uh, well, it's the issue is uh, it's, it happens solely in uh, stretch mode. There was no uh, single uh, report about seeing this problem apart of, uh, uh, of stretch mode. And moreover, the severity, I would say, is pretty low. It's just about uh, wrongly calculated, about miscalculated stat. Okay, in FDF, but still. So at this uh, point, it's, I would say that the severity is low. But the patch touches uh, the crash wrapper. Uh, to summarize in one sentence, it appears to me like uh, like a treatment with uh, of, uh, like a treat like in between in medicine, or like a treatment of flu at the cost of doing extra surgery at the cost of doing heart surgery. I'm pretty worried about potential uh, about potential. Uh, fallout uh, from uh, from merging this yet this doesn't mean that we don't want the patch uh, there was an uh, actually this case is uh, also interesting uh, it's a good example that on how downstream can work uh, for the sake of uh, of, uh, of upstream we asked uh, our uh, our QE uh, our IBMs QE engineers uh, to uh, to take a look on that, and in their testing, it's fine actually. Yet, I don't perceive this as a good candidate for uh, backporting. I wouldn't. Uh, I'm afraid of actually uh, merging this to uh, to, to reef, uh, even even to squid. However, as we are at the very beginning, as squid was pretty recently cut off, I think that uh, we have entire cycle, entire T cycle uh, for hammering the patch uh, over uh, uh, over tautology for one year, which seems fine. What do you think? Is this uh, is my perception of the problem uh, right? Because, well, I, to, to be honest, I think it's something of small severity. I um, I can understand that it's that uh, that you're not feeling comfortable uh, merging this. I mean. Well, I'm reluctant to be honest. Uh, 
one uh, so so I would be completely fine with merging this only in like what, what you said like uh, after squid uh, and then yeah test it I mean there I guess uh, other changes in the code that might be tricky but get, get merged and then we just need good tests uh, to make sure we actually catch them before they hit a uh, final release yes so um, so I would be I would be fine just having this this fix um, in like a, a future release and not have it backported. Um, one one thing though, I'm pretty sure, but I can reproduce that that I also hit this issue without having stretch mode enabled. So just having the um, the different uh, well the the the, the, the previous um, default crush rule for this will also give this behavior. You don't need to. Uh, engage stretch mode, so, uh, so oh, to say. Oh, okay. That's so, okay. yeah. Um, I was writing in the chat that I can suggest that we might just put the workaround um, rule to be either default or a, you know, favored um, rule in the documents um, such that, um, you know, it kind of will solve that MaxFL problem. Um, yeah. the, the difference is like I explained the first, the two takes will favor DC one, uh, primary rights and reads and the second crush rule would basically be like a mix. Um, yeah, that's what I understand. So that's the only difference. Yeah. So I, I think they're like almost equivalent or maybe even completely equivalent might be even more excellent. Um, not sure. Uh, I already asked Zach to uh, yeah, create some documentation for it and make it the default, or at least put a warning. If you think it should be the default, we can just also get rid of the warning and just yeah, just make it the default, and then users might not be scared off. Or uh, um, yeah, so yeah, that would be would be great. Um, all right. Well, um, I think we have. Uh, agreement on this issue as well. So let's, let's move on. Um, ah, no, not, not yet. Um, there's something. So that's when a nice example of when one bug leads to another, <laughs> or at least exposes another. Um, so I used a balancer, uh, Jonas Jelsen's balancer to do some, um, well, balancing of course, and I actually got some up maps that violated the crush policy. And as soon as you turn off half the data center, you will actually notice which PGs were affected um, because they get inactive. Um, and there was some other tracker that I think Laura um, and also um, uh, people who mentioned incorrectly, Radoslav uh, was working on. And that involves uh, upmap verify code. And also with regards to the primary balancer. And I just want to make sure that uh, the changes that are there will also um, catch this case that I hit. That would be really nice because, well, to have it the default, I think um, we should make sure, yeah, that you cannot hit any invalid upmaps. Um, that that's that would be like my requirement, so to say. That I mean, I think we should should not want to have users hit and yet an uh, well another issue just because of this. So, not sure how I, um, yeah, I'm not sure what, what which part of the code uh, has been um, has been changed uh, and how we can test this. But if there's a patch I can test, I will know, I'm uh, will be happy to do that. Um, yeah, I can um, uh, provide some context. So for that um, that bug uh, that you mentioned, it's um, improving the or it's it's fixing the verify crush uh, uh, or verify upmap um, function in the crush wrapper code. Um, since uh, if you have a crush rule with two two or more choose steps, so multi-choose uh, steps, um, it doesn't verify that uh, correctly. 
So that's the case that we're handling with without regards to stretch mode or just in any any case. Um, but uh, with since it, or it just like we were talking about, you know, changing the the crush wrapper code is such a core part of the um, the code that it has to be well tested. Um, and that's what we're working on in that bug, particularly writing really efficient unit tests uh, or comprehensive unit tests so that we're catching all those cases. So that's helpful that you're giving us another case that we can test with this. Um, so if you could update, I, I think I saw your message about that tracker. I know which one you're talking about. If you could update that tracker, if you haven't already, um, with the crush rule that you're talking about or a crush rule example that you're talking about with stretch mode, that would be really helpful. Yeah, sure, I will. I will look it up and uh, add some more context there. Um, yeah, even yeah. just just the an example crush rule is is all oh, that sure. yeah. needed there. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it's it's, it's it will be the default uh, crush rule example uh, basically. Um, so yeah, and if I uh, well as as far as I uh, know, I yeah uh, yeah these invalid crush rules uh, can be created. Um, just like the default balancer wouldn't see any improvements, uh, and they. I couldn't reproduce with the default balancer. I'm not sure if it would also create invalid map maps or not. Might be able to, yeah, to see if it if it does. But anyways, um, yeah, it should still be catched one way or the other. Um, all right, I will do that. Yeah. Also, um, also, if you're willing to share an OSD map that reproduces the um, the issue, uh, that would also be helpful. Or, or you know, if, uh, I know you're. If you're using the online balancer, that's fine. But um, with a um, e uh, even if you're using the online balancer, we can tell with the offline balancer tool with the OSD map tool, we can use that to reproduce uh, what you're seeing. So the same state, helpful. yeah, sure, yeah, I will. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah. Then another thing that recently a couple of other users hit is that it uh, stretch mode doesn't seem to work uh, when you have device classes in use. Uh, apparently, well, uh, uh, um, before there, were, there weren't a lot of users using uh, device classes with stretch mode, or I guess otherwise we would have seen uh, earlier reports. Uh, it would be really yeah, nice to be able to, uh, to use them. Um, and I also wonder, um, yeah, because uh, when you engage stretch mode or enable stretch mode, you you define a particular crash rule that it has to validate against. And if you would use multiple crash rules later on, then stretch mode, um, you know, I don't know, it just has to deal with it, I guess. I mean, it should be able to work with them. There's no extra step as long as far as I know that's uh, uh, stretch mode uh, does to make sure that uh, another rule that you want to use is also stretch mode safe, so to say. But maybe you, uh, you know, yeah. might might of know course. about this particular um, part. So personally, I've never um, experimented or tested with um, using device class, so that is something new to me. But um, thank you for um, sharing this, and so I know that yeah. Um, this is one of the cases where you can use um, stretch mode. Um, as far as like using another, uh, redefining the crush rule and engaging in stretch mode again, again, that path I've, I haven't tested with um, as well. So um, that's also another use case. Um, one thing I, I saw in the tracker that you ran into issues where um, when you, know, fa you fail over like one data center, and the PG is becoming inactive, uh, which is not ideal. Uh, it should be working with, you know, only one working um, data center. Um, I'm curious to see the what the root cause is actually is. Um, so I know that you have collected some logs, but um, I would love for you to like share. You have like cluster logs, monitor logs, OSD logs, um, and you've provide like the timestamp when you are failing over and the timestamp where you're bringing it back up again, even forcing it to recover, um, that would be super helpful. I'll, 
uh, all of this, I'll make sure I'll, you know, put it in the tracker again for what I'm looking for. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to see um, what exactly went wrong there. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely want to uh, experiment more with like device class as I see um, it is has a practical real world use case and we should you know support that. Um, yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, I will. Yeah, no problem. I already have a lot of logs collected, but I, I will redo the whole thing. Uh, no problem. Um, make sure I get everything you want. So yeah, if you just can write down what you're specifically looking for, what tools you want me to use to collect logs or what, um, yeah, just uh, let me know and I uh, will do. Um, cool. Um, so yeah, then there's one more thing. Um, and I added another like example to this tracker um, this morning. Um, and then it's about the default policy that Ceph uh, stretch mode uh, sets when you enter degraded stretch mode, that it says the min size to one. And um, at first I thought, well, it's it must be some hard requirement because otherwise stretch mode will not function, but uh, that's not the case. I, you can also set min size to two again, and there's no uh, issue there. And it makes sense, of course. Um, and basically, I would have like two things addressed here. I would like to have the default change to two, because I think um, it deviates from from the well the default uh, way self is uh, where you create the default self pool with um, with replicas. Um, you have uh, min sizes two and, and sizes three. I think we should be on the safe side and have the default to two. Um, so yes, it means that any other failure will make PGs unavailable, but it's the same if you would have like a free uh, a default replicated pool, uh, either free data centers or free nodes. Yes, you can. Your failure domain is like this one data center or this one host, and any other failure will uh, give you in a, inactive PGs, which is exactly the point uh, on being on the defensive side and uh, yeah, uh, have data integrity over availability. I would like to have it a manual step, like from an operator, to overrule this potentially uh, increased risk decision of putting it to min size is one. So uh, it, it's my opinion. I'm pretty strong about it. But uh, I mean, if, there's good, if there are good reasons why you would not want to do that, I'm happy to hear them. And if not, then maybe we, we, we can um, make it the default to put it on two and have a policy maybe, uh, like a knob that you can say, I want to have the default policy. Like I know that I will run the risk of of a higher data, data loss and I'm, I'm accepting it and you can put it on one and, and, and stretch mode will do the right thing for you. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's the last thing I would like to uh, emphasize. I, I don't disagree with you on when you say um, you're willing to have integrity more than availability. Um, I think um, I liked your idea of having like a an option um, for the user to either go um, either of those two cases. I think I wanted to discuss.